So, good uh, morning, everyone. Good morning. Welcome to the first annual Mshokopolu Memorial Lectures. We are happy that we have been able to make time to come and be with us. We have a special array of guests who are going to be able to speak to us today, and all our speakers are actually here present. My Lord Bishops, our guests who are here present with us, our students, ladies and gentlemen, Today marks our special occasion for Bishop Okulu College. Today marks our special occasion for Bishop Okulu College. We chose this special day, the 13th of March 2024, to become Bishop Okulu Memorial Day, and it will henceforth be marked here at the college annually. This year, we are beginning by marking it with a series of lectures, which we hope will be published at the end of this, as we remember the legacy of the late Right Reverend Dr. John Henry Okulu. Ladies and gentlemen, this day was not chosen in random. On a day like this, 13th of March 1984, the late Right Reverend Dr. John Henry Okulu was here in this very college, in this very place, Starting this college, then known as the St. John's School of Mission. Some of the people who were present at that time have gone on to become bishops. Others went on to become senior clergy in the many dioceses that have since been able to spring from the diocese of Maseno South, by Bishop Okulu led. The 30th of March also marks the day that the late Bishop Henry Okulu passed on and went to rest with the Lord. So the day is very significant, and that's why, my Lord Bishop, today we have a cake as we mark the 40 years of existence of Bishop Okulu College. Shall we give the Lord a round of applause? And so to that effect, I want to humbly request my Lord Bishop, the Bishop of Bordeaux, Dallas, the Right Reverend Professor David Cordia, and the Assistant Bishop, the Right Reverend Dr. Amy Onyaro to come and lead us in the cutting of this cake and we mark 40 years of this great institution. I'm requesting the Venerable Karen Logano please to come and help us in this. Our academic team. <laughs> so for the for those of you who are here today, we hope you can come back in 40 years' time and say I was there when they were celebrating 40 years. Yes. As we cut another cake. Yes. By that time this will be a very big university. And that is our prayer. Now, we want to move straight to we want to move straight to our first um, lecture, which will be our keynote lecture. And the keynote lecture will be delivered by none other than the Right Reverend Professor David Cordia. The Right Reverend Professor David Cordia is a professor of theology of many years and has served in different institutions, including the Great Lakes University of Kisumu, Kisi University, among many others. He was also the longest serving principal of this institution, I believe serving in about 17 years, if I'm not wrong. So we are very privileged, we are very much privileged to have him here with us to give the first keynote for the first annual Mushapakulu Memorial Lectures. I want to humbly request that we settle down as we invite our Father in God, the Right Reverend Professor David Cordia, to come and give the first keynote address.
Lord Bishop Karibu, let us give a round of applause as he comes. Yes, thank you, um, Dr. for such a privileged moment. First of all, it has not been an easy thing, I believe, to organize a very important day like this. It's working. I was told that you must hit it to test. <laughs> Even here it is working, you must hit it. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I want to thank my colleagues who are here. First and foremost, Bishop Joseph, who had been a mentor to many, many of us, and who also had the opportunity of being the principal of this institution. Together with the Bishop Emily, who also had the opportunity of being the principal here. And also was my tutor. And Bishop Simon said, I don't know how to say it. Who also was a student here <coughs> and is now a bishop. And my old friend, Professor Mbiola, <laughs> whom we met many years back when we were just starting, very late to university, but still was. At the very different stage, it was an institute, tropical institute of community health, mm. where we served for a very long time. And all those who have passed through this institution, I know if all of them were to come here, this place would be full. But we have one problem with our culture. That once we have left an institution and we turn our work, that's the end of it. Most institutions in the world are actually sponsored by alumni. But in our case, we find that most alumni from this place are those who are serving in the main ministry, where most of us feel so much limited that we think that there's nothing we can bring back as a token of our position. It's a day that we have to challenge ourselves. What is it that we can be able to do to this institution so that it could grow and grow and grow bigger than that? What contribution can we make whenever we come to this place? What is it that retains our memory? I can remember how in that 1984, <coughs> but the way 1984 is not when this institution was started. 1984 is when theological education was inaugurated. Yes, I guess so I am being pregnant. And when we sat up there, there was a big open tree over there. When Bishop Okulu came to inaugurate the institution, 
and the students were introduced, the first students were introduced. Those who are still living and those who are being promoted to glory. They became a beacon of hope that something can also happen along the door that will transform the entire thinking of the church. So when we look at this place, this institution, each and every one of us must have played some critical role to make it work it is today. And what we have been doing is building on the leaders in our person who had a clear vision of what the church should look like, the church in the present as well as the church in the future. The name Bishop of God is a name that was to be called in this country. So for the institution, for the college to think of opening its doors for an open lecture on Bishop of God it is something that reminds us of how much debt we owe to the development of the church and of the institutions supported by the church. What role we have to play to leave that legacy of our founding father. In Kenya, in the 80s, and even the 70s, and even the 90s, the name Bishop Okulu dominated the media. Everywhere, people talk, who is this Okulu? Some are calling him Okulu. Some are calling him different names. But there is one thing we probably even wish Joseph has not thought about. Bishop Okoro never called himself John Okoro. He was just John Henry Okoro. That's when he is complete. Yeah. So there is no part of his name that will be missed out. A person whose signature also signifies who he is. A person of very soft speaking, but focused. A person who knew what he wanted to say, and who said it to the extent that everyone will understand what he said. In all the history, So who is this man with this show of God? You cannot talk to a person without talking about referring to where he comes from. The family of Bishop of God came from this place where we are, a single piece. And they migrated to Lama. But he kept on reminding others that he is from a single who lives in Rama. We cannot ignore our roots. Sometimes when we are in better in life, we tend to forget about where we came from. This man had his past, which I want to share with you. 
first born. He belongs to the first branch of African clients who had the earliest education in Europe. At a time when diploma or certificate or no certificate was considered more than enough for religion. Many people had gone to St. Paul's, the moon, some to Maceno, like Bishop Wasong and left the first of us coming to Maceno. But some of these people, they were not coming with certificates. They were just going there and they are trained in Bible and whatever that they come back and they were ordained. But the privilege Bishop of Blue had was that he was working in Uganda where education was considered to be at a top priority. So he attended, when he felt the call, he attended Bishop Taka Theological College or Seminary. After attending Bishop Taka, he later progressed in his education. He realized that that was not enough. So he proceeded for his father's studies to Virginia Theological Seminary. Where some of our clergy have also passed through, including uh, uh, Reverend Ambrose Adair, not Adair, Ambrose Adair. So by the time he came and left Uganda, where he had disagreed sharply with the government of Milton Obote. He came to Kenya, where he ventured into journalism as a way of advocating for the rights of the other people. His orientation in journalism prepared him to learn communication, the best communication skills that would stand the test. All the time. So that whenever he spoke, it will be difficult for you to find fault in his statement. He learned how to communicate, when to communicate, and why to communicate his ideas. You can have an idea, but if you can't communicate it, people will not understand what you're saying. I'm talking about Bishop Okoro, an excellent communicator. And one thing about him is that he was not making noise. More often than not, we tend to think that when we Talk so loudly that's when we are communicating. When we make too much noise, that's when we are communicating. Communication is all about how we articulate our thoughts and present it in a way that it will bring clarity of what is done. And that is what Bishop Okono was about. Bringing clarity of idea in a way that we think it will ignite reaction. A communication is meant to ignite reaction from the people. One thing about this man is that he valued education so much. And all his children, he had six children in total, two boys and four girls, all of them passed through university education. That shows you how he valued education. 
to a point that when he is true to speak, anyone sees someone who is sufficiently prepared to deliver the message. He was a Kashmir with a sense of inspiration, inspired excellence, diligence, and responsibility. Though it was a very short time, for those who did not know him, he was somewhere. But his ideas were taller than his body. So that he could be able to see what others were not able to see. But again, if not those and some of his remarkable qualities that inspired confidence people had in him over the years. In the midst of that, he was attracted immense criticism from those who had seen things different. So don't be shy if you also ignite criticism from people, including his own clergy. Glad you were here. They will even disagree with me, not that you're not the first person to disagree with you. <laughs> and they want to be the last one. <laughs> Despite the good things, the respect, the heart, the community had in this person, still the sound of the people he was working with, his own life, could not find anything good in him. They didn't like it. They locked their eyes. And they didn't want to see anything else. Could remember there was one clergy who had gone to his office and they held him by the court to want to meet him. He was one clergy. We have seen all those things. And these things have been repeated here in the <coughs> And the thing we show was something that also understands what I'm talking about. But as for me, it was like, <laughs> I'm teaching you things. Oh, you can't stop lying, you can't put it in the room. You can't have a hand when you go. We are coming back. I'll come back. I live in this situation. Let us say, can't deny the news. <laughs> so that was the mission. And one clergy who also is supported and helped when he was rejected in Nairobi Access decided to turn against him. He tried to bring him closer, he could not come closer. He even made him a canon the way we also make canons. He was taken at us. To a point that when Bishop of Gold died, he even refused to attend the funeral. Today, I want to guarantee that home does not look like the home of a church minister. You can be cast without one casting. You cast yourself. Allow me now to look at Bishop Okuno 20 years of service as a bishop. It was 1974. After I had been persuaded to become the second bishop of the Diocese of Asensio. Know that previously he was the first African to become the provost of all Sensei, which was a quite only church. <coughs> that place 
with his prayer of confidence. People saw in him a person who could deliver. Because even his language, communication skills, his manalism was no more than a person who is highly exposed. He was smart and he was impressed. So when the first bishop, Ephraim Sagola, retired, the Jokutelians of people are the ones who have prayed that let Bishop Okul be the next bishop. Because they knew him, he was a brother in Christ. I hope you understand what I mean by that. He was a brother in Christ. He was in the revival movement. Even when he was in Uganda. So they knew him, they trusted him. So when he became a bishop, for 20 good years, I want to say, his legacy remains unshared. We need 20 years of his service as a bishop. The church transformed. The child transformed his theology of development. The child transformed his theology of uh, ordination. The child transformed his theology of social services. The child transformed his theology of ecumenism. Can you see of his personal involvement? Marcelo Sound became the first diocese in the African Church to start the development program as a social responsibility. Courtesy of Bishop of At that time, money was streaking, flowing from the Western coffers like torrential rain. He did have to write big proposals. Only a letter from Bishop Okul with his no signature was enough to bring money. Because he was trusted. Throughout his ministry as a bishop, the total amount he managed to raise. Today could be in millions. He did not steal from the church, but the church stole from him. When he left all sense of petrol, <coughs> he was earning a salary of about Six thousand. But when he came to a certain south as the bishop, his salary was reduced to three thousand. He was contented. And he believed that the Lord who called him would open other ways. Yet which quick has become and it is amongst most of us. We want to get rich so fast. If Bishop Okul were to root the church in order to be rich, I think he would have died a very wealthy man. He would have died a very wealthy man. But that was not the case. I knew the family so well. And I'm like part of that family. Bishop Okul did not die. He died a simple servant of the Lord. Whose very mission was to bring transformation in the church. And this is some of the things he did. I just want to highlight something. 
The second thing was he gave you in this legacy. As a vision. One, he lived totally certainly in planning. For the subdivision of diocese. Today, the problem affecting the American church is the creation of new diocese before they are ready. And that's the problem my, my brother Simon used to me. Creating a diocese when people are not spiritually, mentally, and financially. Bishop Okuno established a mechanism of creating diocese when every structure is already in place. Marcelo went when it was the first one to be created. For any there was an appeal there. There was a bishop's uh, launch in India. There were several structures already in place. So when Bishop Mono became the first bishop of the same way, he had a place to start. Thinking beyond the doors. That was the, the bishop of all the way Marcelo, when Shabbat Mianza is saying, he had put everything in place. It's not what we are witnessing today. The second thing is the lack of pain of institutions of learning to promote education and training. This being one. There is one in Zulu CIDC, which was one of the best we had in the family. Today there is no more. There are so many institutions this time. There was product. The things he started, we are still there up to date. Person who believe in growth and development. Another thing is investment in commercial space. Bishop of Paul believe that the church cannot grow without financial support, without investing properly. That is not spiritual materialism. In the spirit of reality of our time. So because of that, he established, he, he founded Alpha House, which was built over the years, and he never benefited from it. Now it is the diocese now who are benefiting from it. We are the ones who are now benefiting from that. With every diocese in this video getting at least one million annually. I'm not my But question. But that's the fact. We are reaping the fruits of his sweat. Of his vision. Do you have a vision? A leader must have a vision. A leader who is selfless should not think of how he is going to benefit from, from this vision, but how his legacy is going to be because of his vision. However, are you getting what I'm saying? That is what Bishop O'Connor was. Establishing commercial. 
So that church should. And again, he also realized that the church should be involved in financial institutions. And he started Victoria Financial Victoria Financial Company, which is now today Victoria Commercial Bank. It is our people who let it down in that area. So that when we could not meet the requirements for the standards of our bank, Asian communities came and bought all the shares and took over. Now it's no longer our, our bank. It would have been the first bank led by the church in this country or in this country. Thinking beyond this. That was Bishop Oko. It was not for his personal enrichment. He was looking at the church and seeing how the church was suffering from media resources, from various limitations, could not be able to cope with the prevailing situation because of financial limitations. The spirit of entrepreneurship was with him. Another thing that Bishop O'Connor stood for is the expansion of the mission and vision of our ecumenical movements. He believed that churches can be stronger if they are united. Not if they are fragmented. Where today we can't agree amongst ourselves, even though we come from one church. He was one of the lead churchmen who ensured that NCCK became the strongest alternative voice in this country. And under his leadership, NCCK was a power to the company. It takes only a leader, a leader's vision and level of commitment to create a impact. You can have NCCK, but if the leadership is self-consistent, there's no impact. Bishop Kuhn led SCK, the strongest voice ever in this country, you this time. And I think Bishop Joseph, you can remember when we attended the vision and calling of the church in the world. It was not easy. That's when you can see how some churchmen are cowards. They are just dominating in their long shoulders when situations are hot. They could not start. Moi was stronger. I'm saying they were invading even the, the conflict because they were afraid of annoying Moi. Then one day was happened. The last day there was supposed to be a press statement. It was it a piano statement? It was a piano statement. And the, the, the presiding bishop of Benjamin was meant to read the statement, but he was not with us. But he came on that day to read the statement. Bishop O'Connor oh, just stopped him. But the other man, not that you are not one of us, get out. It wants him. Go ahead. Go ahead. And you are not one. You are not one. There was a time they were supposed to issue a strong statement. You know how they were thinking they were the key people. So they agreed to issue a strong statement on a particular subject. Chester House, that was where they used to meet in a room. Moi got rid of it, and he should have wanted, if I get terrible in there, 
Oh, this people is appearing because your phone was left alone. So when he looked, he tried, there was no more light, so he could not get out of his room. They all disappeared. Including the strong guitar, this time the guitar also disappeared. <laughs> he was alone there. Then he said, after oh, the situation, then when he was out there, all this, I asked. They asked me to be on their behalf. <laughs> He participated also in the ACC at the World Council of Judges, where he was a member of the Church Central Committee. That's the theme time of the ACC. You can't be in that Central Committee if you're not a pastor enough. Otherwise, they would have said, if you're not a man enough. He was revived. And his contribution to the World Council of Judges was even recognized when he died. I was in a committee that was arranging for his funeral. The UCC sent us 200,000. That time, that was a lot of money. Even the NCCK sent us 200,000. I had left of his many years. Bishop of Kuru. Also, before he died, he led the revision of the American Church of the Constitution. So what we have today, the constitution we have today, was his heart. When he suggested that Archbishop needs a, a diocese of his own, where he can find a castle. But then that became the first sister federal and some other country. Within 20 years, Bishop Okonu did a lot that some of us, even if we are given 50 years, we cannot even do a quarter of what he managed to accomplish. And that happens because he had a passion. For his calling. He knew the God who called him to serve. Now, let's look at a cool condition. One of the key things that Bishop Okuno stood for so strongly in his country, and the brothers of God, was the issue of justice. He thought justice. He acted justice. He learned justice. He prophesied justice. And he was using the media as a mode of communicating his ideas about justice. To the extent that the name of God became a brand in the media of the time. And I want to tell you for free. <laughs> if there is a paper with a headline, Bishop Kuru, and there is another paper with a headline, Moi, the one the Kuru will send, the one with Moi will be that one. Tell you young people who never knew who the man was. He was a commercial magnet for the media. Because whenever he said anything that captured in the media, that paper will sell. 
And they believed that the name of God was by their investment. A name can be an investment. It's a name of the A name that when people hear about, they are shaking. I could remember. There was a time he was somewhere in Raya And some people attacked him. Some kind of youth women attacked him. Though they were they just had him. And the media decided to write. Bishop Okuro Scarf was, you know, they with the people around with my chest and the watch. They didn't have no budget, they just, just said it. That paper so so when the media asked him about how how these people are armed, he did not want to deny that these people have any of my chances. But he simply said, you know, those people I have got confused and you don't see anything, I got confused. <laughs> because they are fighting the same war. So, there are certain situations where like you, you have no how to handle the truth. You handle the truth with wisdom. It's called the social intelligence. Social intelligence, thank you, my <laughs> You handle it with intelligence. <laughs> Not with thought. You don't have me. At the same time, when I was reading, I was asked how people are, I say, I know. <laughs> there are certain things, you get, it's safer to say you know, than to say you know. Yeah. This is a person who understood the boundary line between the church and the state. He knew that both the church and the state, they are God's institutions. Just like Paul is saying in Romans. He knew them all. But they had to check on each other for their common good. And this prompted him to write the book, Church and State Initiative. He knew there was a time when the child was seen as a strictly evangelical entity that is only meant to talk about Christ, to sing about Christ, to sing about forgiveness without talking, touching on the issues which affect peace. And child was constantly asked to keep away from politics. Then a full intellectual came. With a masterpiece of writing, spelling out reasons why church should get involved in politics. That led to his first book, Church and Politics in East Africa. Bishop of Kuros family man. He cherished the privacy of his family. He knew the value of family as a unit of refuge that must be protected. But our culture is such that sometimes we infringe on the dark territory. And of course, Bishop Asanga is, uh, is our, uh, you just come here and you want. Sometimes Bishop Asanga is supposed to have some time with the mama and they go, we are not. I'm an American. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes we need that. So when people realize that issue, if he has a gift, then he started talking nonsense. His gifts cannot, people cannot enter his place. He has to be with you throughout and even on Sunday. Now it's only a little time with his family you want to interfere with.
And because he understood the value of family, he also understood the value of marriage. Yes. You cannot talk about family without talking about marriage. And that led him to give direction when he published his book, Church and Marriage. Are we together? That's the mission of cool. I know. Then he also understands the value of testimony, personal testimony. Say it. How did you encounter Christ? How have you lived with the Christ? How has your life been over the years? How many people have you encountered? What are some of the challenges of it? That is personal testimony. And that led him to publish his last book, Quest for Justice, which is his autobiography. Telling it all. And in that place, he is here he is talking about racial justice, injustice in the US. When he went to a restaurant and he ordered for chicken. <laughs> and the waiter came back and said, so, we don't sound like here. <laughs> and then he said, yes, I understand you. I asked, I ordered for chicken. I don't need that. A man who to stand firm on the ground and speak his mind, not to be the malice, but as a responsibility to communicate God's way. Truth should not be spoken in the atmosphere of malice. But it should be spoken in the atmosphere of love, in the atmosphere of concern and responsibility. What are these guiding principles? What are the things that guided his life? He was guided one. First, by his faith in Christ Jesus. And he was a Christian. A Titanist who believed that things must be done right. <coughs> some, in fact, you some of the like, if you are not some amateur fool, I think you are connected with you. Because he believed you must properly dress. Today you find that like coming for a wedding and in a town in, in, in something else. We don't know even what how to go. Bishop, we tell you how the why is where it was. I think well was in any time. No way. If you're not letting let it be known that you are Man. What are you hiding? He was ever, he was very big that the find should go outside without a door. And no one, you see, <laughs> no, even this is around except that some parts are covered. <laughs> <laughs> You know, bishops don't make the same. So he was inspired by the faith in Christ. Secondly, he was inspired by a knowledge of constitutionalism. He understood the constitution, the guiding rules of the moment. So it was very difficult to be in time. Because he understood what the law said. He was also guided 
by a sense of compassion. The feeling that is an inner post feeling that something must be done right to improve on the quality of other people's lives. Things that must be done right. He was inspired by that sense of compassion. And that's why he started Christian social services, which today has evolved over the years, and today we call it American Development Services, mm -hmm. to meet the needs of the underprivileged. Inspired by that sense of compassion. Again, he was also inspired by the spirit of self sacrifice and denial. As a leader, there are certain things. You must take risk on behalf of others. You must say certain things that others can say. He used to tell us when he came here, when he was student, that being a bishop is my security. He used to say that. Because there are certain things I talk about. If I was not a bishop, I would be gone. But the idea of killing a bishop. Like there was a time when he and Bishop Mugge, the Bishop Mugge, were on top of campaign against social injustice in this country. Mugge received a warning from the government minister called O'Connor, Peter O'Connor. He was warned not to go to Russia. Because he was going to pollute the minds of the people there. He together with the whole of the world never to step in this And Muge gathered a carriage and said, See you in Russia. That was the end of If those who were there to remain that was there, see you in Russia. And indeed he went to Russia. <laughs> but he didn't come back alive. You know, sometimes the passion we have for social justice would require some wisdom and some strategy for withdrawal. Because the evil is real. Are we together? Mm -hmm. That's why when you saw me going outside the country sometimes, I was doing what he grew up in Brooklyn a day or before. You go for deep penetration. And then you forget about you as a man. You regain it. And when you come back, what's happening here? Some requires some Now, who are these audience throughout the life of Bishop Paul? Who are these audience? When you are writing a book, and you want to present that book to the publisher, they will ask you, who are your audience today? Who are you trying to reach with your message? His audience were one, the elite in the society, touching their hearts so that they could be able to reach out to the people. Mobilizing them for social action. The other audience, the entire church leadership, we inspire, including the Anglican church, is on police. They were afraid of him. In fact, meeting would be better if it is not about. Good things will just go smooth. No one will criticize him in his place. Things will go on smooth. But when he's there, he will make for that. No. And once he has spoken, that will carry the day. The third was for his condition. There was a time when he told me, don't allow those people to speak in comfort. Make them feel itchy on the time. That's when they will be made away to the reality. 
And they could make you feel that compassionate as a student. Again, the fourth man, his audience was a human of body or class. And the last one, the other period. So, what were his media of communication? One, he used the media intensively to air his name. The use, good use of the media. You know, one thing I want to tell you about the media. Media will not come for you if you don't have substance. They will not. They have no business. You find out when you are talking, you can talk something. <coughs> Maybe they don't care about what they say. Build yourself. Consistently on the summit of integrity and truth and the living tragedy. Many are like those who are brave, those who are bold enough to stand and speak for them. He used the media effectively and he never gave them money. You know, the difference between us and the politicians is that as for us, we don't give them money. We allow them the freedom to pick on the substance from our talk. But for the, for the other side, it's different. The other side, what they do is that they mobilize resources to pay the media. So you find you are with a politician here, a politician who was not even the guest in anything, just came by, and all your sermon is never covered. But the politicians, <laughs> the nonsense that the politician is saying, that is what is okay. the nonsense. I just want to say the fight over non-issue. That's what they call. Again. He used the pulpit very effectively. His pulpit. When you are given opportunity to preach, how do you engage? How do you engage the audience? How do you rel relay your message? Or you are wasting time at the pulpit. You know, Pulpit preach as if that is the last time you have. You know, we had one of the greatest evangelist clergy in this in the old diocese called uh, Umoni. Arthur. Arthur did not have high education, but was passionate for the message for preaching. And he died while he was preaching. That's how he collapsed after preaching. So let us use the pulpit effectively as Bishop Okolo would use it. Not by making a lot of noise. No, no, it doesn't work. <laughs> the substance of your message, that is what will carry it. In. The third one is in writing. Writing. You must write. You must leave something behind, something written, that people will be able to read and know what you actually stood for. The culture of write, reading and writing is so bad in this country. Here is the only place that even if you publish a book, you don't publish it for profit. Because if you're looking for profit, I doubt whether you will be rich. Professor, you have published others. Are you getting a lot of money out of it? It's not only for sharing the knowledge. I've published some, at least I got some money. But it's not for profit. It's for sharing 
information, your thoughts. You will never die. <coughs> Today, I pity some academicians who cannot publish. I wonder what they are doing in university. Because a university professor or lecturer who cannot publish something, and the only thing he's doing is the work of writing and reading, that person has a problem. <laughs> <laughs> I already have two in the way coming. One about my testimony. Starting with the birth place of Waja. <coughs> I was born in Waja here. The whole of that Waja is mine. That's where I was born. <laughs> <laughs> Ending with the, with, with the election of the Bishop of Honor. That's space one. So start developing interest in it. I will, I'm saying it all. I want to assure you that I everything I'm saying in that book. Write something. Even if people don't agree with what you are writing, you just write it. They don't have to agree. Who has told you that they must agree? I don't want people to agree with me. If they disagree, they also disagree in writing. Not just reading it. If you don't agree with me, with what I say, you also write. To, to, that's how we, we fight. In the academy, that's how we fight. I'm an American. That's how we fight. I will write if I don't agree with what Professor Mignola is saying, I will say it. He said this, but my investigation, my research reveals this and that. That's how we work. So if you cannot fight me back in writing, keep quiet. Thank you. Or forever hold your peace. <laughs> so those are the three media that Bishop Okolo used to air his feet. Now, as I conclude, I want us to look at the key things now he left us as his legacy. There are certain things that Bishop Okolo left as his legacy. There are six things which I want us just to go briefly. One, his immortal writings which still outshines even modern writers today. I doubt whether there is any other writer who will talk about church and bodies other than what Bishop Okolo did. Hmm. We only quote. He is a point of reference. We are called to be points of reference. He is a writings. We can be found anywhere. Universities, colleges, etc., etc. Now it's working. Are you sure? Have you beaten? Yes, I'm not sure. The second, like I have said about the books, all the books he has written, he has written Church and Marriage, he has written Church and Politics, Church and State, Nation Building, Quest for Justice. Church and Politics in East Africa, and many other articles which are not yet published. I really tried to cite for those are of his writings, but I think they have been published here. Oh, okay. And I have two others. Oh, that's good. Yeah. Then the second legacy is the imprint of the humanitarian space. You cannot talk about the ecumenical space in Kenya without Bishop Okolo being at the center. And that's why he has been honored, even by St. Paul's University in Europe. The library, there is many men out there. And they call NCK. And there are some schools called Bishop Okolo. And this college, the imprint, of his name, Castles. Third, 
The investment in commercial buildings for the church, which now gives the diocese in this region a million every year. Fourthly, this is very important, mentorship. You cannot talk about Bishop Okuru about talking about the people he mentored. May I tell you how difficult it is to mentor people? Bringing them to be somebody, to be people who can also stand on their own. Recognize the potential in each and every one of his life and promote some who are willing to be brought. Not all who are in. I remember there was one who was given a scholarship. And at the same time, Bishop Muke also granted him opportunity to be the provost in Eric. The prince refused to go for scholarship in the US <laughs> and chose to go because he wanted to be a provost. Provost, I'm begging of the provost. <laughs> he ended up not being even a provost. <laughs> <laughs> What's the name? <laughs> mentorship. <laughs> if it were not for Bishop Okuru's sense of mentorship or mentoring, is the young clan. Bishop Joseph Pasoga would not be a bishop today. Mm -hmm. Bishop Abiro, the late Bishop Abiro, would not have been a bishop today. Bishop Johannes Agueta would not be a bishop today. Even Bishop Charles Ongito would not be a bishop today. And this property would not be a bishop today. Even a younger Nehema of the late Nagadema would not be a bishop today. Even Bishop Oweti. Even Bishop Oweti would not be a bishop today. He mentored people. But some are not mentored at all. You try to find a big God. So all these bishops have excelled in their own way <laughs> due to the mentorship of Bishop Oko. May yeah. yeah, I tell you one thing? There was a time when some thought that Bishop Oko got me a scholarship because we come from the same village. That's not true. I think he looked round and they know the truth. I was the best student here. Bishop Ariel. <laughs> Not only that, the highest moral discipline, I also exercised that. He didn't know me. But there was a time he was in trouble. Today I have to reveal this. When he was being attacked, and sometimes he took him to court, like a uh, 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 the late one who was the CCS. Uh, uh, in Marcelo, uh, there was a family who was um, who had taken him to court. That time he was there. Uh, to my daughter. My daughter. <laughs> there was a time he was. And the media, they spread so many things in the media. And I was a stranger. I wrote him a letter of encouragement. Mm -hmm. Just a personal letter. You know, we always receive personal letters from now. But I wrote him a personal letter. As his characteristics, after two weeks, he gave me a response. We should only not know how to write so many words. Straight to the point. One sentence letter. Thank you so much. And from there he started inquiring about who I am. That's what we need. 
Do right thing and you'll be nowhere. The fifth thing, leadership, is boldness. Boldness. I think in the matter of sharing attributes, I share this one with him. I don't know how to deal with cards in my life. I don't know. I don't know. Maybe you can teach me privately how to accommodate them, but I don't know how to deal with cards. Bishop Paul was never a coward. But it was strategically born. Passionately wise. So that it's not just a matter of moving with chest. With the hair. So his boldness was seen when he made history to ordain the first woman as a priest in Kenya against all odds. Only to be followed by another one again. Here, Bishop Emu. I also followed Bishop Emu. I'm also hot. <laughs> and the first woman, Bishop Emu, yes. is it? You know, when someone is your mentor, you do things that you also make him happy. Say that you are the most student. Someone who takes money head on. Someone who will challenge the hypocrisy in front of his own colleagues in the church. He was bold enough. Number six, he left the name. And it's that name that has brought us here today. The name of God evokes memories of struggle for social justice, war against dictatorship. The name identified with resilience, with brilliance, high voltage of critical thinking and resounding boldness that could shape the entire morning. Remember the time when Moi said that he had closed the debates on Madipadism. Everyone went quiet. Then the following Sunday, Paul was come and said, Mr. Moy, you cannot close what you did you not have in the first place. <laughs> the debate has just begun. And it never ends. And then Moy had to say something. That's the name that has brought us here. Now, editorial of his beliefs, as I said, he believed in family unity. Secondly, he believed in sharing personal stories as an inspiration to others that led him to publish all his books. And lastly, self-propagating, self-sustaining, and self-governing church. That was his idea, following the, uh, also the, 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 the teachings of a day proper for those who have studied church history. He believed that church must be self-propagating, must be self-sustaining, and must be self-governing. For this will help the church to maintain her dignity in the face of atrocities. So today, as we mark the legacy of God's son of the church, 
saranno come te a sostare. Hanno intervento a spiritual leader, a social worker, a father. We thank God for his life. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Bishop David, and uh, I want to acknowledge a great judge that uh, the Bishop has shared with us. I know today a number of us are seeing the Bishop, Bishop John Henry Okulu, in a new light. And uh, just to keep the fire burning, I would like to ask one, one or two people with questions that are burning to ask the speaker who has just sat down. <laughs> please, if you have a question or two, this is the time. One or two questions, please. We have five minutes to do that before we allow in the next speaker. Yes, there is a question behind there. Chaplain, can you share the mic with him so that uh, the bishop will get the question right? Here. Okay. Thank you. I'm very much grateful for you from the same discussion. I'm just concerned from um, the later police police of institutions and some faith. One thing is the ATC, Bell, another one is um, Victoria, equal to Confetti. I was concerned because you can just the day the Reverend Colonel Mayaki came to a diocese and talked to us about mission. And he mentioned some of the institutions started by Anglican Church, but they failed. I'm worried. Thank you. We'll take the to the second question, just behind there. Thank you, Bishop. Uh, and I did ask for Bishop Okuru. I was confirmed by him and I, I knew him. In the list of mentorship, if we include all this, would we be wrong? Bishop Jonathan Umolo, Bishop Joseph Masonga, Bishop Johannes uh, Sangeta, Bishop Anna Inyan, Bishop James Ochiel, Bishop Joshua Wete, Bishop Maya Piero, Bishop Benoit Donyango, Bishop David Henry Colia, Bishop Emily Donyango, uh, <laughs> Bishop Adiema, I was not sure with the mayor, and for me to start with him. But I know Edward is here, I know how Father was with Bishop Ophulu when he was here. So that was his motivation. This is Bishop Ogilio. Um, I'm not sure. is the one who is Bishop Ogilio. Okay. <laughs> on this, you cannot argue when you're okay. okay. <laughs> <laughs> on this spirituality, we can go to the line of comment. Whenever Bishop Ogilio was, there was that sense of um, spiritual atmosphere. That type of aura in the in the room. I know one time he was in the parish of the child, and he was not saying a lot, but still God said we talk to you. So that made me believe this spirit, uh, and yet you see that spirit in place, that that spirit come back. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there was, there was that sense of uh, spiritual coolness and something mm -hmm. you just feel that it's a man of God. Uh, 
Thank you. Last comment, let us give to our brother uh, there. Comment or question, and then the bishop will take time to make a final comment. Thank you, Pastor, for our staff. Um, the Reverend Fred Fosfeldo, the Reverend Agathe from Marcella West. Thank you, the Reverend Professor James Fagia, for an internal exposition of uh, the duty of the late Bishop Henry Okulu, uh, particularly in the church, basically the Anglican church. From the time the institution of Bishop Okulu College of Theology and Development began, a big name, the great name, uh, from St. John Mission School, now Great Place, it has developed names. But from the look of things, this college has produced men and women, great men and women of the world in the entire region and even the province of Kenya in the Anglican Church. What can we do as a church to enable this college have a root and it grow? It's why the tree was planted, it has some development roots, it has reached the hard rock, to some extent it was dying, but grew now a Dr. Edmond. It is gaining some meet on the ground. What other things can our the six regional bishops do to enable this college grow to a better college than the way it is? That is our work. I want to thank you for all of bringing the highlights from the doings of Bishop of Polo in matters of development. Uh, of institutions. Thank God, when Bishop Pasoka was retiring from the Diocese of Asena West, we have now Bishop Pasoka Plaza, and we have the Bishop Pasoka Foundation going on in the Diocese of Asena West. Thank God, you, are, you will be going home and you know, in the next few years, leaving the Bishop of the Diocese of the, 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 the Sena Plaza on. Apart from that, what legacy do you want to leave as a bishop in this diocese, within the regions that will be remarkable as of the bishop of all? Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Just give the uh, give the mic back to Bishop David. Just give the mic back to Bishop David so that we say one time. Bishop, you have an opportunity to respond. <laughs> <laughs> oh my! <laughs> what legacy? <laughs> I, I want you to listen to me very carefully, and I'm very serious. I'm not laughing. <laughs> you are asking me. You are telling me that I believe in love. What are the legacy? Very proud of living here. One of the legacies I'm living in is that you are my student and you are Unless you are not productive, I'm not going to be productive in life. So that's my idea. Another legacy I have here. How many students who pass from here? Just stand up. Just stand up. Now, what legacy do you expect other than all these able people? Sit down. Look at their shoes. <laughs> that legacy. Another legacy. Are you seeing that building out there, the administration block? 
I'm the one who extended it and created the other way. When I was here. Are you seeing this feeling here? I'm the one who modernized it. Got millions from abroad. And we restructured it. What other legacy are you talking about? <laughs> I'm just talking about here. That solid building, the first one in the video, I'm the one who did that to mobilize funds for it. What other legacy are you talking about? <laughs> and I'm not all. I am confined so many people. <laughs> 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 They are for us because we don't want them. And again, management, we don't have sound management systems and policies in place. We put wrong people in strategic places and they cannot be able to manage. So if there is bad management, it doesn't matter what institution you are managing, they should go down. That's why I think in our curriculum, I don't know whether you have <laughs> shared it out, there is a component of management. It's always there. Understood. It's always there. Unless you don't get it, you want it only for innovation, but if you want it for life, then you must understand the critical role of management. <laughs> That's why some of these institutions collapse. So, I've said about all these institutions, what can we do to develop the college? I said, I began my speech by saying that alumni all over the world, they are the ones who are building their institutions. You go to Alliance, you will find the same. The way, if you go to Uganda, Mama Aida, Mohairas people, don't expect Bishop Kwasonga, who was not an alumni here, to come, and, because he was not an alumni. <laughs> He was not. Bishop David was not. But I expect Bishop Simon to mobilize resources to come and support here. <laughs> I've done it myself. I've been doing it here. Even when I've become a bishop, I'm still support here. And we are still expecting many here to come here. <laughs> so it's a question of where is your heart beating? in terms of developing institutions. So you, 
and I tell you, you are now in Nigeria. What do you think since you left this institution? What do you think that you are brought here? Which you can say? Because the person who will invite you here, even for a long day, you will not come. Even a small thing. See, even those people who have really struggled to be outside the country and come back, they have not invested here. But at least they invest themselves. <laughs> so it is not a question of bishops. It's a question of all of us. Are we together? Yeah. That is what I want us to understand. It is not just the bishops. It is all of us who are here. Who have passed through this institution in different ways. Either as a, as a lecturer or as a student. Or as a person from this region. You all owe this institution a debt for success. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, Bishop, may I just say something? Why should I get it? I may forget, may forget <laughs> during my presentation, but I want to ask if you do not have an alumni association by today, mm -hmm. as we are leaving, please begin an alumni association. The second thing which is easy to do is to create a scholarship, an alumni scholarship. Then you ask all of us to contribute to it, we will do, and that will help this institution. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bishop David. I think that one has been a very enlightening moment. Uh, I'm well educated and uh, I've learned a lot today. I did meet the late Bishop of March. I met him twice on telephone. I got the guy in calling when there was rumors going around that the Bishop wanted to be a lady for a year. I picked a phone and I called him and I told him, Bishop, I don't think that's the right thing for you to do. You have been a hot giraffe in this region. Please don't go down and start messing up yourself. The next time I called him, my local church at home had asked me if we could get hold of Bishop John Henry. I was surprised. Humble man. He received my call and he even gave us a date that will come. He came down to my church and said, I'm from this region and I've never come to this church. This is the first time. I'm happy that you people are doing a good job. I give you 10 bars of strength. So, the third moment I met the bishop was when he was confirming my wife. So, <laughs> <laughs> I really want to thank God that I met such a humble person without meeting so much physically before that. Friends, I hope we have been, uh, our temperatures have been well raised. We are now ready to receive our next speaker. And I have the pleasure to welcome Professor Mudo. Hard work for you, please. Why do people stand up and stretch your hands, please? And if you want, you can jump up. <laughs> now you can now please sit down. <laughs> It's a great honor to be in this place. My very first time to be here at Kokise. And I'm very grateful for my friends, uh, Dr. Edmond Oguera, for extending his invitation to me. And also grateful to be here in the presence of. Uh, the bishops, the honorable bishops, yeah. Bishop Kodia, Bishop Wesonga, Bishop Simon. It's a great honor to be with you, to meet you in your territory. <laughs> I first met Bishop Kodia. Um,
at, at the Great Lakes University when it was a baby and we contributed to the coming up of Great Lakes University. The uh, Reverend Professor Bishop Dr. Godia, uh, together with our good friend Dr. Kasedi. Uh, Bishop uh, Wesonga and me come a long way. When he met <laughs> Bishop Wesonga was, was, was a young man in high school. I was 42. <laughs> <laughs> At that time, I think I was in Form 6 or yes, yes, in Form yes. 6 at, at Alliance High School, and we used to meet in Christian fellowships. So we come a long way. Uh, Bishop uh, Dr. Emily, we teach with her together at, um, oh, we teach with her together at St. Paul's, is it not? At St. Paul's University. So I get the opportunity to see her from time to time. Um, Bishop Simon, I think we met only one, this is the second time. It's really pleasant to be here. In this congregation, there are so many people who know me, except uh, Dr. Gera, Reverend Dr. Gera, maybe one or two people. Um, Mrs. Ogera was kind enough to give me a lift <laughs> from the airport to this place, and I'm very thankful. So I need to say a few things, a little, a few things about myself. Although I'm not here to talk about myself. I come from the neighborhood. I come from Maseno. That's where I was born and grew up in the diocese of Maseno. No. When I was born, it was still one diocese before, before it split. So I knew the diocese when it was one. And for me, I belong to both sides. Because my mother was born this side, and my father was born that side. <laughs> so I, I really be, be, be belong to God. So I grew up in Maseno, um, an Anglican church there. Um, they, uh, they are the ones who um, gave me the honor of appointing me as the canon of the Anglican church, Maseno North. But I became a reverend in the Doma when I was working in Tanzania as a translation consultant for the Bible Society and also for the Bible in Africa, and then became a priest at um, All Saints Cathedral. Mm -hmm. Now in terms of um, my background, I teach at St. Paul's University. I've been teaching there since 2015. I taught at the University of Nairobi from 1983. But before that, I was a tutorial fellow there. Um, what, what else about me? I've been associated with the Great Lakes University when it was still called Teach. I am married uh, with one wife who comes from Uganda. <laughs> so if you visit me, you'll be able to enjoy some matoke. I have two children. One is a pharmaceutical and cosmetic scientist, but right now he is in Tanzania. And I have one daughter who is a, a professor of sociology at Princeton University. So that, 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 that gives you at least uh, some background. My wife is from Uganda, so if you visit me, we eat a lot of matoke in my house. And uh, when I grew up, we were talking both the law and the uh, I am. Um, <coughs> My, my uncles are from Nyahera. So that's really my background. I'm born again Christian. I um, was born again in the 1960s when I was a student at, at Alliance High School um, in, in, in Kikuyu. I continued to grow in my faith. At the University of Nairobi in the 1980s, I was one, at one time the chairman of the Christian Union. And there's this thing called Focus. I also happened to be the first chairman of FOCUS when it was formed in 1975. Um, this thing called Fungabano House. You've heard of Fungabano House in Nairobi? Mm -hmm. And when it was opened in 1977, I was the first director of Fungabano House when it was brand new and handed it over to, to other people. If I joined the University of Nairobi, as a tutorial fellow, assistant lecturer, 
and then now you can see it. I am a professor. So that gives you a little bit about my personal story, my personal history. Of course, there's plenty that I have not said. The most important things I have not said. The things that I have told you are things which are in the public domain. But things which are in the public domain really don't say much about you. Things that are important are things which, which are behind me, which people don't know. Okay, so I can go on and on like that. I was asked to come here and talk about the future of the church in Africa. Challenges, changes, and opportunities. And this in the context of lectures in honor of the illustrious and unforgettable right reverend John Henry Okuru, founding bishop of the diocese of Marcel renowned prophetic church leader, outspoken critic of the powers that be. Just begin by saying that reflecting on the future of the church is a daunting task. Right at the outset, we look at two relevant and fundamental questions that need to be asked. The first question addresses itself to the justification problem. Justification problem, that is, why do we need to think at all about the future of the church in Africa or anywhere else? Or for example, the future of the church in, in your village or my village, the future of the church in our diocese or my diocese, the future of the church in our denomination, in our country, in our country, in our continent, even the future of the church on planet Earth. Why should we reflect or think at all about the future of the church? That's the big question. The second and relevant fundamental question that needs to be asked is what I might call methodological. It relates to matters of method, approaches, and concerns. The how question, how should we think about the church? What methods or tools should we employ in thinking about the future of the church? What approaches should we embrace from this question? So, I talked about the first question, which is the justification question, the methodological question, and the third is the content. What is the future of the church? What are its contours? What is its trajectory? Where have we come from? Where are we going? So let us now turn to the first question, namely the why question. Why question? In reflecting on the why question, we will limit ourselves to considering just two responses. That of those who reflect on the future of the church in order to better prepare for it or to better equip themselves for life in the changed conditions or circumstances that the future might bring. In other words, looking at the future and trying to see what is your place in the future, what are the contours of the future, what does the future, what will the future bring? This is akin to what weather forecasters do. Forecasting rain or thoughts, uh, forecasting rain or drought contributes to better preparation. Meteorological forecasting of future weather patterns or scenarios is an example of this. It allows for relevant planning and preparation. Similarly, reflecting on the future of the church allows for planning and preparation, a readiness to welcome, to confront, and to bring changes to that future when it don't. In other words, what contribution are we making to change, to mold the future? The business or enterprise of reflecting on the future of the church requires a deeper understanding of the times and of the seasons in which we live. And as a corollary of that, the happenings and going on. Because the future of the church is a product of the present. The future is a trajectory of the present. The future does not come out of a vacuum. The future is built on the manure, on the soil that we create. Rooted or engaged, a rooted or engaged deep understanding of the present. So when you are rooted in the knowledge of the present, practitioners 
means people who deeply reflect on the present, extrapolate into the future to behold what awaits, what lies in store. Such an extrapolation assumes that the present is determined by its past and that similarly the present determines the future. Reflecting and engaging the present while grounded on a sound knowledge of the past is sure to yield a better grasp of the contours of possible future trajectories and directions. Thus, we might envision the future on short, medium, or long-term basis. Clearly, past, present, and future are inextricably intertwined or inseparably bound together. A full understanding of the present points back to its provenance in the past. Indeed, a comprehension of the present without appreciating its origins and foundations in times past is hardly possible. Similarly, the future surely proceeds from the present and so builds on it. The present contains the seeds that sprout in the future. If the seeds are those of mangoes or oranges, we may expect only mangoes and trees, or only mango trees, orange trees in the future. If the biological parents of a child are mixed, we may surely expect the baby to be of mixed race or ethnicity. This is the raison d'etre and basis for future or futuristic ruminations. Forecasters of the future are sometimes referred to as futurologists. Proper forecasting of the future derives from a solid understanding of the current and prevailing conditions and extrapolating them into some future state or states. And so to properly think about the future of the church requires a solid and deep understanding of the current state of prevailing or present conditions of the church. To understand the church in the future, we need to understand the church in the past, how the past has molded the present. The understanding the present and extrapolating that into the future. In other words, we see how the future influences the present. In the same way, we try to imagine how the present will influence the future. Those who indulge in the difficult challenges of envisioning the future on a sound basis proceed, as indicated already, from an informed, knowledge-based, fact-grounded, empirical basis. From such a vantage point, they may seek and expect to gain insights necessary for a rethinking and reordering of current realities and trends. This may take a visionary, prophetic, revolutionary, activist, change-oriented vantage point or perspective. This is one, 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 one aspect. The, the, those who take this approach are motivated by the view that we can influence our future. It is inspired by the idea that what we do now determines what the future will be. Hence, future outcomes are determined by present realities. What we are now, what we do now, does and can offer a mirror of possible futures. What we are today and what we do today is a very terrible indicator of future likelihoods or outcomes. In other words, the future cannot be completely far from what we are doing now. We can see a glimpse of the future in what is happening now, in what we are now. The future does not fall from the sky. A prophetic, critical, creative, revolutionary, change-oriented approach to thinking about the future of the church necessarily proceeds on the basis of a well-informed understanding and grasp of the current situation of the church. In other words, we need to understand the church both from a sociological perspective, a social scientific perspective, as well as from a spiritual perspective. We need to take into consideration 
a multiplicity of factors, demographic realities, because you cannot think about the future without thinking about the demographics of the present. We need to think about economic realities, religious, religious spiritual realities, social, cultural realities, political, ethnic realities, educational, pedagogical realities, and trends, and so on. These realities and trends are then usually projected or extrapolated from the present into the future. In other words, if you have a social scientific understanding of the present, it gives you a view into the future. In other words, understanding the future is not a subject of dreams. In other words, expecting someone to have a dream and tell me what God has told him the future will be. You can actually read the future in what is happening now. In other words, the future will not be completely different from what we are experiencing now. We cannot expect that you who is a black man now, in the future you will be an Indian. There is no connection. Or who is black now will be a Mzungu. Or you if you are male now, in the future you will be female. Reality is not like that. The future is a baby of the present. An example of such a prophetic, revolutionary, critical, creative, change-oriented approach to thinking about the future may, may be exemplified, as I say here, in the life and ministry of the revered founder of this lecture series, <coughs> the Right Reverend Bishop Henry Okuru, in whose honor and memory this lecture series is appropriately them. Those who reflect and think deeply or present realities and their implications for possible futures walk in the tradition and footsteps of the renowned biblical Old Testament prophets or in our context in the footsteps of illustrious and courageous ancestors such as Bishop Henry Okulu or Bishop Muge or Bishop Gitari, among others. They this, did so fearlessly, courageously, prophetically, with a view to the transformation and reordering of existing current conditions and structural realities, whether they were political, economic, social, religious, educational, theological, demographic, etc. In other words, these prophets looked into the present, have a deep understanding of the present. So a prophet is someone who really understands the present, he understands what is going on. He understands the kind of things which are sprouting to grow, and he speaks what he has seen in things going on. Say, so given what I see, this is what is happening, going to happen. So. A prophet who looks into the future is deeply grounded in the present and deeply understands the present and understands the present in terms of its sociological, in terms of its economic, in terms of its religious, and so on, in every dimension. And since given this, what is likely to happen? What is likely to happen? In other words, a prophet thinks in probabilistic terms, in terms of probability. Given this, this is likely to happen. Given this, there is a high probability that this is going to happen. In other words, it's a question of probabilistic thinking. And of course, we talk uh, in religious terms, we talk of prophetic terms. But we talk of probabilistic terms because a prophet does not speak in a vacuum. A prophet speaks from what is current what is possible, what is going on, and says, given this, this is likely to happen. Because these people are terrible, because they are sinful, therefore, God is going to punish them. It's difficult to say, these people are so holy, these people are righteous, therefore, God is going to punish them. You see, that doesn't follow. <laughs> Punishment follows from a certain reality. There is a cause and effect. 
So, grounded in the present and deeply critical of present social realities, and needless to say, from an empirical and fact-based perspective, a uh, futurologist of the church envisioned likely futures, that is, what the future might be, or what the future could be, or what the future is likely to be, given present realities and trends. So there must be a cause and effect, a link between the present and the future. And it's not something that is out of the blue. It's something that could can be connected. On such a basis, and bantering for it, they attempt an extrapolation into the future. They tend to implement projections and predictions of possible futures and scenarios derived from an understanding of existing factual situation. You could say on the basis of a social scientific understanding of the factual situation. That means a deeper understanding of the present involves and understanding the sociological factors, the economic factors, um, and all other factors that are relevant. The rationale and reason data of this exercise is to provide a rational basis for an ethical, value-based moral perspective for change management and transformation of the present in view of the desired and hoped for future. In other words, transforming the present is based on an ethical, value-based moral perspective. In other words, we are thinking of the present and what it is, but we are also thinking of what it could be. We are thinking of what it ought to be. You look at the present and you are dissatisfied with certain factors in the present. You say, I see this and I don't like it. This is happening, it is destroying us. So you envision an alternative future. You envision a better world. So secondly, we refer those such as the we refer to those such as the 1960s, 1980s Kenya-based researcher. So I'm referring to a Kenya-based researcher of the 60s and 80s, um, who was based in Kenya, a physiologist and master statistician, a gentleman called Dr. David Barrett, uh, who wrote a famous book called Schism and Renewal, which some of you here may be familiar with. But one of his most famous books is called The Wild Christian Encyclopedia. He also wrote the Kenya Church's Handbook, um, mentioned with schism and renewal. On the basis of up to date statistics, numbers, and figures depicting present and imagined realities and the life of the church, he offered predictive empirical project projections of possible features and trends. Dr. Barrett was preoccupied with an understanding of existing current religious spiritual realities and trends. His interest and intention was not to foresee um, possible uh, um, um, his intention was on the basis of the present to predict what was to come. I had an opportunity um, to work with Dr. Barrett at the University of Nairobi at Fundamano House. At that time I had been appointed the first director of Fundamano House and Dr. Barrett was uh, the secretary. Dr. Barrett was a revolutionary because he wrote a lot about the African church. Uh, if you want to understand the African church, Dr. Barrett in the 1960s, 70s, Dr. David Barrett in the Buffalo to go to. And right now the World Christian Encyclopedia, very knowledgeable text on the state of the church in the world, you go to the book which Dr. Barrett, uh, Dr. David, uh, Barrett, and, and so the basis of that he tried to make projections into the future. Another person which we need to understand the African church, Professor Mbiti. In the case of Professor Mbiti, he moved from the past. The past informs the present. The past informs the present in terms of understanding the religious heritage of Africa, understanding African traditional religions. You cannot understand the present church. We cannot understand the independent churches without understanding that social reality which is behind, historically behind 
uh, our African situation. In other words, our churches are not coming out of a vacuum. They have their own in uh, social realities, in uh, economic realities, in uh, anthropological realities, sociological realities, historical realities. Those explain the present. And so the present gives birth to the future. Um, proponents of this line of thinking are not actually interested in bringing about societal change. Their research and knowledge production is not in order to change or transform the future, but in order to provide grounds for understanding the future, likelihoods, or likely, likelihoods or outcomes arising out of the present. Their interest is rather in knowledge for its own sake, and that's what Dr. Barrett uh, was trying to do. He belongs to this group, and um, its relevance can be seen in the regular updates and editions of such key texts as his World Christian Encyclopedia, which he wrote many years ago, but is being updated um, almost on an annual basis. So, two questions, two questions to the white question noted above, namely thinking about the future in order to change it, and thinking about the future without a change agenda are not mutually exclusive. In other words, we think about the future as a child of the present. So we seek to change the present in order to influence the future. For some people are not interested in change. They just live on a day-to-day -day basis without knowing what the future will bring. But a wise person thinks about the present and sees how he can tinker with the present to bring about a better future. Prophetic, critical, creative, revolutionary, change-oriented thinking individuals are concerned with change and bringing about the reality of a church that is in line with God's word. These individuals are expected to be committed to the use of accurate, well-informed sources and a grasp of present realities and trends. They see their task as interventionists. Their interventions are intended to avoid or foretell undesirable features or outcomes, given present realities and trends. Their interest is in bringing about change and desirable future states or conditions. The alternative position is, as I say, their non-interventionist approach that is satisfied with present knowledge, well-documented facts, databases, as it is for its own sake. There is no interest or desire to use the new knowledge to influence possible features or desired states of affairs. Thinking about the future or envisioning future scenarios and states of affairs is a complex exercise. Looking at this process in hindsight will help us understand and appreciate the complexity. To illustrate this, let us for a moment imagine ourselves as time travelers, effortlessly traversing through space and time, back and forth, let us for a moment go back in time to the day of Pentecost. We witness disciples gifted and speaking in multiple time, times, tongues. They do this before diverse multi-realistic, multinational, multi-ethnic, multilingual crowd audience. That first past century world is rather small and limited. The means of communication and travel at that time are incredibly <coughs> backward and slow in comparison with our own which is intercontinental, global, interplanetary, cosmic, intellectual, scientific, and so on. Ideas about the future, entertained by first century Christians, who dare to reflect and the reminding the future of their faith and their newfound community, some refrains refer to a technical movement would have been totally unrecognizable in view of what actually happened. I wonder what the expectations of the church fathers regarding the future of the church vis-à-vis -vis what it actually became. The challenges, the persecutions, the martyrdoms that ensued were probably not imagined. Martin Luther's rebellion against the established church, the Reformation, the church in the 16th century, the rise of Protestantism, the aging divided Christendom would have been unthinkable. The 19th century global missionary movement which led to the opening of frontiers on every continent, the spread of the gospel to the uttermost parts of the earth, 
echoing ancient biblical prophecies and their futuristic inclusion, the whole cosmos and the entire created inhabited world were perhaps beyond expectations. The realization and fulfillment of these prophecies belongs to the category of the unimaginable and the impossible. So we too may imagine or envision the future, envision the future of the church. Our ideas or imaginations regarding the church of the future may turn out to be completely counterfactual. But we may hazard a few our thoughts. Let, let me just do in bullet points because I can see people are ready to go for lunch. <laughs> <laughs> the part of schism and renewal. Uh, David Barrett, who I mentioned, wrote a book about schism and renewal. So you can see this as a reality that will continue. Schism and renewal. Churches breaking up, churches being renewed, churches coming together. We see this in Africa with the rise of every individual wanting to have his own church, the independent churches. That's a reality that will continue. Number two, commercialization. Where people are using the church for commerce, mm. for business, for profit. In other words, they see the church as something that you can own, something you manipulate for your own ends. So that's a factor that will go on. We can see three, the development of individual individualization and personality cults, where you use the church to build your own ego, you become a, a, a cult, a, a, an institution that revolves around an individual. So churches which revolve around these personality cults are many. And another development full of in integrity, the development in the, the moral scenarios in the church. Oh. Number six, we talk about ethnicization or the tribalization of the church. Having a church you can call your own, by calling a church of your own clan. You say a church you can call your own, a church of your own ethnic group. So that's a, a, ten, a tendency that will continue, ethnicization of the church. Uh, then call the crisis of professionalization, professionalizing the church. That's another development in the future of the church, professionalizing the church. Why you find now you have specialisms within the church. Mm. So we have people who are specialists in this, and specialized in this, and specialized. So within the church, we don't have one person who knows it all. But for everything we have, so the rise of professionalization. Then the problem of doctrinal purity and beliefs, doctrinal purity. In other words, what is the pure teaching of the church? Is there one standard teaching of the church with a proliferation of, of sects? And each one, each sect thinks it has the truth, who is right. In other words, what, why we have the standard for deciding which of the many sects holds the truth? So that, that's a, a, a challenge. Then, um, behind Nans and elsewhere, the traditional the problem of dress codes. I think in the, if we look at the independent churches, we see this problem of dress codes, isn't it? The way those traditional people in the independent churches dress, uh, and how the various dresses did contest uh, issues of power and who is who, by how you dress, hierarchy and power. Then we move to the issue of power and money and morals and women and polygamy. These are issues that will be of concern in the future of the church. Then issues of structures, church structures, and whether they will be hybrid structures or pure structures. Uh, and of course, the issue of professional ethics. So I could go on and on, but um, if I go on and on, I think some people will start dozing. <laughs> but I think I've given you some ideas for thought. At this stage, I may seek permission to hand over the microphone to my friend. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much. Thank uh, you, Professor. Hello, Laura. That's quite uh, a great talk opening us to the future of the child. Uh, he has observed that some of us are already yawning. <laughs> so, why don't we give ourselves just a few minutes to get some touchy 
uh, issues that have been raised, and then from there we can now proceed for that night. Uh, there is a hand here, and uh, the person who was helping me is not here anymore. Okay, thank you. Oh, he's there. Okay. All right, thank you, Prof. And um, happy to meet you in person. Happy to meet you in person. Uh, very informative. Uh, five questions. I uh, have one person who is going to Now, um, sociologically speaking, how promising is the future of the church in Africa? Um, that is the only one? Yeah. Prof, I think you can hold it. Let us get one or two more before you come to the floor again. Yes? This? Just bar the mic, please. <coughs> uh, my question is uh, what, what is it? that has gone wrong with the church of today that is making the future not be a child of the present. Despite you speaking of some aspects that uh, the church should have, what do you think is wrong that is not making the church of the future, not be a child of the present. Thank you. Thank you. Last question. Yes. Yeah, raise a hand here. Thank you so much. Bon Thank you, Professor, for uh, giving a scenario about the future of the church. In Africa, we look like, and uh, I have a question based on the one of the legacies of the past we are converting today. That is mentorship. You have clearly said that today is the seed of the future, and uh, reflecting on. Uh, like I said, the past one we are commemorating today, he mentioned on mentorship in order to prepare the future uh, of the child that we are experiencing today. He is an ever leadership and vibrancy which has resulted from his mentorship. And uh, if we can focus to the future, as you have said, we find that in order that the church may take what kind on with the work of, uh, of the legacy of leadership that uh, the late bishop had, there is a serious need of uh, carrying on with that leadership today. And for that to happen so that we have a vibrant future church. It will require, it will require proper training, government for training, proper preparation of the carriers of the gospel, that is the ministers of the clergy. And when we look at that in our context, not the wider context of Africa, we find that the context of the lake region now suffers seriously in economically to prepare the people or the servants of God to carry the church forward. And that would possibly bring a big future of the church within the lay vision. What would we do? And what are we doing? And this is a serious question to our leadership. Because you find our students in the theological colleges struggle a lot by raising so raising money to train themselves. And uh, the generation that is now vibrant today are carrying out the church had a very, very strong support from the churches. 
Now, how can we as a church uh, catalyze the same same churches today in order that we raise resources to support today's theological students in order that we mentor the foreign and future vibrant leaders of the church in the lay region? Thank you. Can I answer those differences? Uh, okay. I okay. think we'll have to go on. You have Let me start with yes, okay. mm. um, let, me, let me start with that first question because it, it, it gave me further. Um, to, to answer your question, the one way you begin by envisioning the future. You start by thinking about what kind of future we want today. Where we want to go. Where we want to go to determine how we get there. Mm. If you don't know where mm. we are going, we will not know how to get there, even what means it is. <laughs> so we start by envisioning the future. In other words, prophetically asking myself, what kind of teacher do you want to have? What kind of chant do you want to have? What kind of people do you want to have the, in the future? What kind of institutions? Then we start building to get such envision desirable teachers. So I think one of our challenges is that we don't think enough about that future that we want to create, we want to bring about. If we don't think about it, then we will not bring it. Then we are living with accident. And this, we are can't even plan because we don't know what it is we want. We have to tell it what we want, what are you getting me? So that's an answer to your questions. We have a second question, because I'm answering the um, can, can you remind me that in one minute? So get the what is wrong with the church that it cannot bat the future? Okay, what, what is wrong, what, what is wrong with the church? I think what is wrong with the church, I will not start with what is wrong with the church. <laughs> It's good to start thinking about what is right with the church. <laughs> Otherwise, we feel negative. <laughs> and some of us are negative. We are always criticizing and blaming and saying what is wrong. That will not help us to get, we have to think about what are the good things they are doing and how can we make them better. Who are some of the good people and how can they be in relation? What can we point our young people to the good things so that they can? Emulate those things so that they can see. If we look point at the negative, we'll actually end up destroying and say the church is useless. Look at the kind of people we have, look at the kind of look at the evils the church is doing. That that's destructive on the church. What builds the church is look at the positive things, look at the good people, look at the good institutions, and see how those can be made better. Because there are so many good things around. A lot that is, is happening, that we, our eyes are blind to it. We can't see it unless, in other words, we can even look at an individual, we look at his negative aspect, and that will let you push him down. And if you look at his positive, it will help you to build that session. The question of attitude, what kind of attitude we have, what the church should have, positive attitudes, positive attitudes about our leaders, and encourage them. And support them so that they can be better. <laughs> Not look down at them and start deploying them, but fighting them and saying how terrible they are, mm -hmm. how bad they are there, what they are not doing. And comparing the present with other good, the good things of the past, they look at, okay, I think you get the point. <clears throat> In other words, um, futuristic thinking is the sense. We don't think much about the future. Mm -hmm. We need help. Good idea about the future and what kind of future we want to give. It's just like an individual. You cannot become a better person if you have no idea of what a good person is. You cannot have an idea of good values if you don't know what good values are. So it starts with the good values and then you aim towards those. I think that's the approach that I would recommend. Thank you so much. Uh... Is there another or one more, more pressing question? Is there another pressing question? If there is, it, or there is, uh, this is uh, Mr. Musa speaking, our neighbor, uh, principal. Mm -hmm. I mean, 
Thank you, sir. I appreciate the professor for the good exposition. Kindly allow me very quickly to talk about three things that I personally think is uh, going to affect the church in very many ways. One, uh, it was symbolic to carry a Bible and no longer we have a Bible, we have a digital Bible. And as a church, how we look at it, we need to really continue carrying the physical Bible and how we learn to reflect. Two, the world out there is preaching artism and materialism. The boys I learned about girls out there believe that there is money in the other end of the world. How, as a church, do we rest of these young men from those hands of materialism? They are always are many good things in the other world. And thirdly, there is the component of very basic and basic youth, which the church is equally valuable. If two young men came to you and told you we love each other, please bless us as a church. How would you deal with that now and in the future? Thank you. Okay. Now, Professor McKelly, we just try to address it. Okay, okay. <laughs> okay. The, the, issue, the issue of the training nature of the Bible is one that I've worked with in my, my profession. Because I've been in the field of Bible for a very, very long time. So you can you tell people that they need to read the Bible study as a scroll? And before the scroll, it was spoken of. Then this one was on scroll. Scrolls were these things which were written on the Bible. And the Bible is the Bible. Yes. Then the scroll is the Bible. And this one is the Bible. Then the scroll 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 is the Bible. Then they were the, the computer. And now the computer, which was basically one of one, 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 um, one dimensional, moved much dimensional. There we you, 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 you see the text through your ears, you see the text um, through your eyes. In other words, it is total um, body, 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 Changing nature and face of the word that we receive. So you no longer just the word spoken, this is also the word, the word written. Not just what is spoken, what written, is the word that is now upside down, so that you can now see. So that also affects the type of Bible that we receive. For the Bible is scrolls which you do not carry, you only write a little syllable. <coughs> then the Bible book which everyone can carry with it, with it. And then the Bible which is not just on your eyes, but also now on your screens. And, 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 and you can hear it read for you. And now the Bible that is, in other words, the different dimensions of the world. But for me, the most powerful aspect of the world is the living world. Where well, the person who has understood that word lives it out. So people don't just need to read it for hear it, but they see you practicing and reading the word. So those are different songs of the world. And the, the, the next question was is it materialism? What do you have to say? I don't How cultism is being preached to the young men? And the materialism that come with it, vis a vis the church campaign to move this young man into the church. I think that you could that the result of the social of the world. It is based on a misunderstanding of the world. It is based on a failure to do a proper exegesis of the world. In its original context, it is application in the present. And this results from people who are not studying the Bible, people who are not trained, people who are not biblical. Uh, foundations and training, they read what is called isogenesis. They read their own things into the world. They read the cartoons in the world. They read all these false teachings in the world. And what they see is not what is there, but what they dream it is not exegesis. Exegesis is the word what comes out of the world. It is isogenesis, what we are reading into the world. The other word is the word. What you want to hear is what you read in the Bible. What you want to see is what you read in the Bible. But the other Bible does not transform you. 
which is you try to transform the Bible and use the Bible as a basis to carry on your own propaganda and your own agendas. But the true reading of the Bible cuts through our agenda, cuts through our thinking, and transforms it in line with what God and the time of God what is. And the last question of the Methodist. Relativity. <coughs> what this is like that there are no absolute values. The Bible does not have a clear answer of what is right and what is wrong. What we read in the Bible say, okay, what does the Bible say? The answer is, is all depends. What does it depend on? How you read it? What does it depend on? How you interpret it? What does it depend on? Where are you are coming from? If there are one voice, <laughs> The church of tomorrow seeming in a lot of challenges, so many, but uh, how we carry ourselves today will give us a charge that we carry beyond our immediate future. So, uh, I'm looking at our eyes and they are telling me, please allow us a few minutes to start, an hour, a few minutes to uh, do the bathroom, whatever. Yeah. I'm giving you that. Uh, we have exactly 40 minutes to do everything that we're supposed to do and come out and sit here by two of them. If you have to finish the things that are ahead of us, please let us say for the lifetime. Take your lunch, eat it as fast as possible, then I'll be seated by two of them. And uh, on that, I want to invite our sister, the Reverend Christine, to come and pray for the lunch. Thank you.